So I used to say that my favorite part was setting my own schedule and that's still a big part of it. But now my favorite part is getting to design my own solutions for clients. Because when I work in the corporate world, it's like, you can do this one thing. You really can't go too far outside of that. And I think that's what frustrated me most. Sometimes I saw that they needed a bigger solution, whatever that might be, more help. And I didn't have the freedom to do that. So now when I can make the, the right recommendations for people to really help them, it's so fun and so satisfying. And it gratifying, satisfying, both yeah. of those things. And it just, you know, um, I get better outcomes for my clients that way. Hello, I'm Erin Marcus, founder and CEO of Conquer Your Business. And I wanna welcome you to Ready Yet? If all you needed was a step-by-step -step plan of what to do, you could buy a book on how to succeed and you would be all set. But here's the rub. You'll never do what it takes until you become the person it takes to do it. The Ready Yet podcast is dedicated to those who are ready to become the person who succeeds, ready to become the person who steps into more, and ready to become the best version of themselves. In the I'm Ready interview series, join me for inspiring conversations with people who figured out who they needed to be in order to achieve their dreams and were brave enough to be that person. Oh welcome, welcome to this episode of the Ready Yet podcast, where I get to introduce entrepreneurs to other entrepreneurs, right? Share their stories, learn what they had to do and who they had to become to get where they are. And I'm excited for today's guest, Sophie Michaels, because we were introduced through a mutual acquaintance and then in conversation found out like we had all, like we're in the same city, we we're in other groups together and we didn't know each other and we had all these commonalities and had a great conversation. And I know that you can share your experience with everyone who's out there trying to get where they want to be. So why don't you give everyone a bit of a more formal introduction to who you are and what it is that you do? Uh, thank you. Um, I'm so excited to be here. This is oh. going to be fun. Um, my name is Sophie Michaels, as you said. My business is called SM Edits and I do writing and editing for professional services businesses. So I work with architects, planners, um, organizational psychologists, CFOs to help them with their writing for their business. Very cool. Yeah. So how did you get started in that? Were you always an entrepreneur or did you get shoved off some kind of horrible cliff or jump <laughs> off a horrible cliff? Right? Because that is what it feels like, whether you got shoved off of it or you jumped off of it. At the end of the day, you're falling off a cliff. Um, and that really is. So how did you end up doing your own thing? Yeah, I, it, it was a cliff situation. Um, I had wanted to strike out on my own for years, but, you know, I felt like um, corporate world was safer. Um, now right. I think completely the opposite. <laughs> I, I, I agree with I you. Know. <laughs> but, um, you know, I was taught to believe that get a job, good benefits, keep it stable. And, um, you know, even though I was pretty bored in most of my roles, not all of them, but I, I, got, I got bored quickly because I felt like I wasn't challenged enough and there wasn't anywhere for me to go. So um, I had been hired on at this job um, like in October of 2016. And then I got laid off in January, 2017. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it was a mess layoff. And it was a week before I was having... Um, a mastectomy followed oh. by two years of cancer treatments. Oh. So, and I'm, I'm fine, but yeah, it was, so I was like, I had never had surgery before in my life. I had never not had a corporate job. So um, I always did some freelance work on the side because it was um, usually more engaging than my full-time work, you know, like meatier stuff to work on. Um, so I cobbled together more work. I contacted the people I, worked with and I, you know, like my freelance clients, but um, I was thinking that I would just freelance for a while and while I was getting treatment and then go back to corporate world. Mm -hmm. And six months into that, it was like, hell no. <laughs> like, I, it was like, you know, that's when I realized like I needed that push to 
figure out what to do. If I hadn't been, um, if I hadn't been laid off, then I would probably still be working in a corporate job and dreading Monday mornings and all that. So one of the things that I'd love to hear your take on, because as I'm listening to your story, how, what was the difference? How did it feel different when you were doing some side hustle gigs and I need to do this in order to pay my bills? Yeah. Oh, that's kind of a heavy question. That's really interesting. Um, because it, you, you mentioned, well, those were juicier, meatier gigs, but I imagine another reason there was no pressure to them the way that there is when this is like your deal. Yeah, exactly. And that's, there was no pressure. So I didn't have good systems in place when I was doing it as a side hustle. Like people could be late paying me. It wasn't a big deal because I wasn't relying on that money to, mm -hmm. you know, pay my bills, go on vacation or whatever. Although that money did help me have nicer vacations, but you know, like, um, it was a nice so to have, it wasn't a have to have at the time. Yeah. But also I was fine. Like people would pay me late and I'm like, oh, whatever. Most of the time, you know, so, um, and then when it became my full-time thing, I had to really figure yeah. things out. When you had to respect your business as a business so that other people respect your business as a business. Yeah, but it took me a long time to get to that mindset. Like I was still treating my freelance clients as employees. I was thinking of them as employers rather than, you know, I called them clients, but the way I would, you know, I would let them kind of dictate sure. a lot of my business. I think that's actually a very common, I, I see that in my own background, yeah. especially in the beginning, because you're just so there's so much going on. A, you're just so freaking happy to have a client. You don't want to do anything that you're going to perceive that client is upset with and goes away. And the other thing is you don't know any different, especially when you come out of corporate. And what we don't realize is A, you teach people how to treat you. So if you're not treating your business as a business, they don't. And also so many people actually do want to be led by your expertise. And we're too worried we're going to upset them yeah. to step into that true leadership role that they actually want from us. Yeah. Well, it's funny because a lot of times people do want it. Some people are still resistant to that, which is fine. But um, yeah, you're right. And it's, you know, I still fall back into that sometimes. Sometimes I worry that I'm going to upset people, you know, prospective clients with my terms and my processes. It's, you know, it's kind of in the back of my mind every once in a while, but I'm more and more, I'm, you know, it's my business, my rules. Well, not only that, I know I found for me, once I'm annoyed, it's really, it's not good in the moment for the person I'm annoyed with because, and it's my fault for having let something get to that point, but it helps me move forward in different directions when I finally got so annoyed with myself that something's got to change. Yeah. I mean, I, I can completely relate to that. I think it, that's kind of another cliff situation, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. The more you can draw your line in the sand. Yeah. But there's also a confidence that comes with it that when you run your business as that confident leader, people, it's almost a credential for the thing your business does. Yeah, exactly. It is. Um, that's a really cool way to think about it. I hadn't thought right, about it. Right, they see you as a professional. Oh, she mm -hmm. must be, she runs her business like a professional. Yeah. So what are you most proud of besides um, having landed at least on some solid ground? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh my gosh. I mean, my answer today would probably be answer different than my answer tomorrow. Sure. So like, I don't know. I think I'm most proud of having been, you know, found good coaches who helped me figure out the systems I need and uh, my sales process and all of that, because um, without that, I would still be stuck in that mm -hmm. mentality where my clients are my employers. Well, and most people's businesses is not 
they don't grow businesses. They do what you write, you know, they do what you do and what your business does. And knowing how to grow and run a business is separate from knowing how to do what your business does. And I think you should absolutely be totally proud of that because one of the biggest mistakes I see is people not investing the time, investing the money or willing to ask for help or any of the other things that prevent you, them, any of us, from learning how to grow a business. Oh my gosh, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, um, (laughs) What's, you know, investing the money is so, so, so important. And when I hear people who are just starting out saying like, oh, I don't really want to spend money on whatever, whether it's, um, you know, like a, a coach or a VA or whatever. Or writing, uh, having a yeah. professional like you write something yeah. compelling. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah, that too. I, but I, I was just thinking of just the business aspect of it. But yeah, the, I guess writing is part of the business aspect. Absolutely. Of course it is. But, you know, if they're not willing to invest that, this is just going to hold them back from growing. But I, you know, I was there too. I was afraid to spend money on things in the beginning. And then I realized they really have to. So it's going to hurt a little when you're, you know, when you're um, typing in your credit card number, but um, (laughs) it's so worth it. So one of the things I love to share because I, the people who have the most visibility are often the people who've really made it, right? The, The big gurus of the different marketing things, the big gurus in the different fields, but it's hard to learn from them because they're so far removed from the path at this point. And I love, sharing the journey because we're all just regular people, which means if we can figure this out, other people can figure this out. Exactly. So in the honor of sharing, how do you figure this out? Like what has not worked? Oh, I mean, <laughs> you know, so back do we, when need, I, do we need like two more hours. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> a, a lot. I mean, I did a lot of really kind of dumb stuff early on, but I think one of the things I did was um, um, I bought ads on like Facebook mm-hmm. and Instagram back when I was on those platforms. And it just, yeah, I never got even the smallest bite from that. And it, I didn't spend a ton of money on it, but I put a lot of time into it and and effort and it was so not worth it for me. I think that's one of the most common mistakes that I do see is, and I don't wanna say buying into tactics because that makes it sound like you should have known better and there's no way for you to have known better, but buying into tactics that your business isn't ready for because Facebook ads is a great freaking tactic if your business is ready for it. Yeah. And so many people, and it's, it's like a double-edged sword because what we see out there is the people who it's worked for Mm -hmm. offering, Hey, this is a solution. And what we don't see in their marketing, because it makes sense for them not to put it in their marketing is all of the years and money and time it took for them to get to a point where they can do this, but they present it as if it's win-win final solution, just do this one thing. And so many people try it when they're just not quite ready for it. That's true. And I think also, you know, when I started, when I formed my entity, you know, it took me a couple of years to do that. I was like, okay, I'm really going to make this legit now. And I formed my entity. And um, I started getting all these offers for things, you know, and like, oh, free, you know, so much free and Facebook ads. And then I bought more because I was like, well, you know, I'm getting these offers. That's how you do it. Right. Yeah. So I think it was just, I was naive and Mm -hmm. like we talked about, um, another time, you know, school doesn't prepare us to be in business for ourselves. And that it makes me angry now that I think about it. Because, you know, they prepare us to work for other people and say, that's the norm. And that's a little bit messed up to me. Well, yes, hundred percent. However, if that was what the education, the free education system in this country was literally invented, created, formed to make better workers. Yeah. That's why it started. You know, if you go back far enough, it, there wasn't school. 
Yeah. And it was created to make a better workforce for a changing from an agriculture into an industrial society. Mm -hmm. And it's never changed. It, it's never evolved since then. And I have no, I have no words. It just like it does, it's just does a disservice to you know. That's why so many of us are flailing when we start our own businesses because we don't have and unless we have um, a lot of funding and backers and people who know how to guide you through the process. If it's just people like us, like if we, you know. And I, I mean, I'm glad that I made those mistakes and learned along the way. They were useful things to learn, but I feel like there might be a better path. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, and I totally agree with you because I'm a big fan of fail forward. Yeah. I'm a big fan of fail faster. Mm -hmm. I'm still looking for fail cheaper. That would be great. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and quick, yeah, like, can I get this all over within a month and then right. I'll be done? I can do that. But, and to your point, the binary thinking of school that you either succeed or you fail. Mm -hmm is a death wish for entrepreneurship yeah. because all you do is fail, but you can just fail a little teeny bit and learn from it. Yeah. Instead of the binary thinking that it's a disaster or it's a perfect perfection. I hope you're enjoying this episode of the ready yet podcast. I know I really enjoy having conversations about who you need to be in order to reach new heights. As founder and CEO of Conquer Your Business, I work with my clients at the intersection where what they need to do to succeed meets who they need to be to do it. If you would like to have a conversation about your business, please reach out to me at erin at conqueryourbusiness.com. Every once in a while, I would, I would get so discouraged and think, oh, maybe I shouldn't do this. but I, that didn't last for long. It would last for maybe a minute or an hour, maybe a day, you know, <laughs> but I, would, I remember when I started, I was happy when I stopped having that thought every hour, like <laughs> yeah. it was only lasting for a minute, but the frequency was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, it was probably similar for me. That's in the past though. <laughs> I'm good with that. Now I'm completely unemployable. There's no <laughs> Same. And when people, you know, try to entice me into a full-time job, I mean, I laugh inside. I don't laugh at the phrase because I would be rude, but I'm just like, sometimes the jobs sound cool. I'm like, I could, I could like this for a month, maybe, right. but um, can I have my Thursday afternoons off to go do what I usually do? And can I, you know, no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So is, so what is your favorite part of entrepreneurship? Oh my gosh. So I used to say that my favorite part was setting my own schedule and that's still a big part of it. But now my favorite part is getting to design my own solutions for clients. Because when I worked in the corporate world, it's like, you can do this one thing. You really can't go too far outside of that. And I think that's what frustrated me most. Sometimes I saw that they needed a bigger solution, whatever that might be, more help. And I didn't have the freedom to do that. So now when I can make the, the right recommendations for people to really help them, it's so fun and so satisfying and it gratifying, satisfying, both yeah. of those things. And it just, you know, um, I get better outcomes for my clients that way. It's interesting that you say that because I 100% agree. I think um, I have a big fancy corporate background. I did very well. I was included in big fancy opportunities and However, I feel so much more closely connected to the impact I can have as an entrepreneur. And that's something that I just see across the board with mm -hmm. entrepreneurs is the ability to, like you said, the schedule, you know, have the more control over my own existence and have a bigger impact mm -hmm. for others. Yeah. Um, I wonder if this happened with you too, but it took me a while to even feel comfortable suggesting doing more when people would, you know, get in touch with me and say, I want you to do this. I would say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do an estimate for exactly this thing, because that's how, you know, that's how it was in the corporate world. Right. And 
once I realized I had the freedom, it was gradual. Mm -hmm. I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. I can, you know, I can make recommendations. And yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that I committed to when I got, I resisted being a coach for a long time mm -hmm. because I saw too many people do it that I wasn't fond of and I didn't agree with from a integrity standpoint. So I was resistant to throw my ring in the hat and label myself something that other people were also doing um, in ways I didn't approve of. But as, like you said, as I got stronger and better and more confident at it, one of the commitments I made to myself is I absolutely will not blow smoke up someone's skirt yeah. If I don't believe they're doing the right thing for them, for their business, not because I think they should be doing something else, but based on the data that I know. And I've exactly. watched so many coaches charge thousands and thousands of dollars in programs to help somebody become a professional speaker. It's never going to happen. They can't get on stage or for X, Y, Z company, you know, they're going to go make a hundred thousand dollars doing this thing and there's no actual market for the thing yeah yeah that's that's unethical yeah and so <laughs> realizing kind of like you know that's my version of what you were mentioning realizing that I can have a bigger impact by having more confidence and sharing my knowledge of what you really need versus what you think you want Exactly. And sometimes, you know, it's not, I'm always hesitant to say, to kind of talk about this to people, because some people think, oh, you're just trying to upsell. And that's not what it's about. And sometimes people come to me and they think they want something bigger and they need actually Wait. a smaller solution. And I'm, I will tell them that. So it's not, it's not always about upselling. It's just about figuring out what's really going to be the best solution Absolutely. for the client. Yeah. And I love that you said that because that's actually sales. Sales is being of service. Sales is yes. matching. Is, sales is figuring out what somebody needs, wants, desires, has, doesn't have, X, Y, Z, all of the above. And then am I even the solution and what would it look like? Oh my gosh. Yes. And I, you know, <laughs> um, it took, that was a really hard lesson for me to learn. And I used to, the word sales was like, it just seems so yucky to me before I understood that. Um, I have a funny story. My brother is, my brother's a printer. He's been a printer since he was a kid. My dad was a printer and had a printing business. And um, my brother is also very well connected. He's been in the industry for a long time and he knows a lot of people. And the place he's currently working, um, the owner pulled him aside and said, we really want you do doing sales because you know this stuff so much better than other people here and my brother called me and said I need you to convince me that sales isn't you know, icky or something I don't remember what word he used so I told him exactly you know basically what you said it's really about helping people and you know stuff you know the stuff so well and you know how to recommend the right things for people you're not trying to pull one out pull the wool over anybody's eyes you're just helping them find the best solution and you know helping them learn about how you can help them. Uh, that was a really no. 90 sentence, but, <laughs> but don't let the copy editor and you stop. That was absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it's so true. And the, one of the things I have the most fun at with when I teach sales is asking people, you know, how many people here are really scared of being the sleazy salesperson mm -hmm. to which most people will, you know, raise their hands. And here's the beautiful solution to that. You couldn't, if you tried, it's not who you are. Yeah. You're not for Tarlick. Right. You're, you're scared <laughs> of being something you can't be because it's not who you are. Mm -hmm. And if you, none of us, myself included, and I'm pretty good at sales is slick enough to manipulate somebody into doing something they really don't want to do. So what I've learned is one of the things kind of like across the board, let's face it. One of the things that holds entrepreneurs back is a view of sales. That's not actually even possible to exist. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, I guess, yeah, I don't know where that stereotype comes from, maybe from, you know, TV and movies. <laughs> Too many, for the, well, for, for people my age, it comes from uh, ads in the 70s from used car sales. Oh, yeah, <laughs> seriously, or Herb Tarlick. Right. We're the same age, so, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you have this business, you're doing big things, you're writing for clients who, and showing them more. What's the next thing for you? Um, I have a group in the works, but I'm not quite ready to talk about it. So that's going to be a new business venture for me that should be launching in the spring, but it's, I'm still ironing out the details and I'm, yeah. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. I love that your, um, looking at what is out there, what you're seeing and thinking, how can I solve for that with what I know how to do? Well, okay. So I will say this, it's, my group will be more, I'll be more of um, an advocate and educator sort of um, Mm -hmm. for people who do similar work to what I do. And advocacy has always been a big part of my work anyway, for my clients and for other people in the industry. And so I really, the idea to tr- turn it into a business um, came from people asking me like, why don't you do coaching on this? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it's how I became a coach too, is enough people asked me to help them and I was doing it for free for long enough where you, know, you yeah. finally listen to the universe, right? Yeah. <laughs> but what I love that you're doing and whether you're doing it on purpose or whether you're doing it by a beautiful accident and much of what you've already shared has been this path as well, as you've learned to, just like as you've learned to make suggestions to your prospective clients so that they get a better result, that's all in response to a marketplace need that has been expressed Mm -hmm. that you can solve. And that's how, that is the best way this works. Whether you go into coaching, whether you're at a service. Now, I don't recommend doing 20 different things that have nothing to do with each other. That's like chasing way too many bunnies. However, the evolution of somebody's business as an entrepreneur is really based on what's the next problem I can solve. Yes. And um, it, this is just a natural extension of what I've been doing anyway. So And when it feels that easy, that's how you kind of know you're on the right path, right? Yeah, I think so. Although, you know, I am having a little bit of anxiety about this because it's new and, but yeah, I, I know. So what is, what is that saying? Fear is just excitement without breathing. Yeah, (laughs) accurate. (laughs) So let's, let's reframe that for you. I am so excited about this new venture. Oh my gosh. And if you keep telling yourself that you'll start to. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And I am. And most days I do tell myself that, but you know, I have those moments. <laughs> and I think we also learn now that, you know, you're unemployable, that there's no <laughs> going back. I think we, as, uh, as true entrepreneurs start to embrace the, I literally, I have a big thing planning to launch next year as well. And I get anxious, excited vibrations when I start working on it and thinking about how am I going to put this together? You know what I mean? And I think true entrepreneurs, we start to um, crave that and enjoy that instead Mm -hmm. of treat from it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I do crave it. And I I guess I worry that I'm just going to start so many businesses. I don't (laughs) think I will, but I do sometimes it's like, oh, I need that adrenaline hit of not knowing what the heck I'm doing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It is kind of intoxicating though. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So if someone wants to continue this conversation, learn about how you can help them with your writing, learn about how you can help them just through a conversation, which is how you and I got started. What is the best way for them to reach you? My website is smedits.com. That's S as in Sophie, M as in Mary. (laughs) edits.com. I was going to say Michaels, but (laughs) Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn at Sophie Michaels. Awesome. You're not hiding. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with me and with the audience. And I'm looking forward to watching you keep doing what you're doing. Oh, thank you, Erin. It's been so much fun talking with you. Thank you so much for joining me on the Ready Yet podcast. 
I get so motivated by the amazing accomplishments of the remarkable people I meet, and I'm excited to be able to share some of their stories with you. You can find more episodes of Ready Yet at your favorite source for podcasts or at conqueryourbusiness.com. And if you've already decided that you are ready to become the person you need to be to achieve your big goals, feel free to reach out to find out how I can support you in your efforts. Or check out the Work With Aaron page on the Conquer Your Business website. I also invite you to share this podcast with anyone you know who loves to learn and be inspired. And if you're so inclined, I'd be absolutely grateful for any reviews you'd like to share as well. Thanks again for joining me. This has been Aaron Marcus, hopefully inspiring and helping you to go conquer your big dreams.